Good morning and welcome to Spearfish United Methodist Church. My name is Hannah and it's a joy to be welcoming you with wor us for worship this morning. Um, as we get started, I'd like to invite you to join our, our Facebook page and join our group specifically, the Spearfish United Methodist Church community, and to subscribe to our YouTube page. All right, please join me in prayer. Gracious and loving God, we pray your presence with us wherever we are to worship in one spirit. Amen. Grief Share is a support group ministry that helps people heal from the pain of grief. The Grief Share video seminars, workbook exercises, and small group discussions give participants encouragement, useful advice, and hope. The videos, they're very believable. It just seems like regular people speaking from the heart. They help me focus my thoughts. Having many different people on the videos from week to week makes a huge difference. The video strengthened me. The way I grew up, people had a funeral. They went to somebody's house, ate a lot of food, and you never talked about it after that. Uh, and to be able to sit in a small group and hear people actually express what I was thinking and feeling was quite refreshing. I needed to be in a situation where I could talk freely about my feelings and my grief and not feel like that I was causing other people to be uncomfortable. My workbook helped me to unravel the feelings that were I was going through. I found that the workbook was so helpful in that while the video, I was watching it, I could make notes. And it helps me go back and, and remember how God can help me. If you know people in your church or community who are grieving the death of a loved one, tell them about Grief Share. Or visit a Grief Share group yourself to heal from the pain of your grief. And remember, no matter how long ago you lost your loved one, you are always welcome at Grief Share. There was such a void until I got into Grief Share. Grief Share has been a big help and encouragement to me. Grief Share brought me out of my sadness. Begin your journey from mourning to joy at Grief Share. God. 
when the sky was starless in the void of the night, our God is an awesome God. God spoke into the darkness and created all the light. Our God is an awesome God. Judgment and wrath he poured out on Sodom. Mercy and grace he gave us at the cross. I hope that we have not too quickly forgotten that our God is an awesome God. Our God, our God is an awesome God who reigns from heaven above. With wisdom, power, and love, our God is an awesome God. Our God is an awesome God who reigns from heaven above with with wisdom, power, and love, our God is an awesome God. Our God is an awesome God. Our God is an awesome God. Our first scripture comes from Genesis 1, verses 24 through 27. God said, Let the earth produce every kind of living thing, livestock, crawling things, and wildlife. And that's what happened. God made every kind of wildlife, every kind of livestock, and every kind of creature that crawls on the ground. God saw how good it was. Then God said, Let us make humanity in our image, to resemble us, so that they may... Take charge of the fish of the sea, the birds in the sky, the livestock, all the earth, and all the crawling things on earth. God created humanity in God's own image, and the divine image of God created them. Male and female, God created them. God, our great creator, as we join in this time of prayer, we hold close to our hearts the upcoming time of transition and the chaos of what that includes in the next few months. We continue to also pray for our siblings in Ukraine for their continued resolve in order to continue in their struggle against tyranny. We pray these together with the words of your son, Jesus Christ, who taught us to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Breathe on me, breath of God. Fill me with life anew, that I may love what Thou dost love, and do what Thou wouldst do. Breathe on me, breath of God, until my Our second scripture comes from John 21, verses 1 through 19. Afterward, Jesus appeared again to his disciples by the Sea of Tiberias. It happened this way. Simon Peter, Thomas, called Didymus, Nathanael from Cana in Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and two other disciples were together. I'm going out to fish, Simon Peter told them, and they said, we'll go with you. So they went out and got into the boat, but that night they caught nothing. Early in the morning, Jesus stood on the shore, but the disciples did not realize that it was Jesus. He called out to them, Friends, haven't you any fish? No, they answered. He said, Throw your net on the right side of the boat and you will find some. When they did, they were unable to haul the net in because of the large number of fish. 
Then the disciple, whom Jesus loved, said to Peter, It is the Lord! As soon as Simon Peter heard him say, It is the Lord! He wrapped his outer garment around him, for he had taken it off, and jumped into the water. The other disciples followed in the boat, towing the net full of fish. For they were not far from the shore, about a hundred yards. When they landed, they saw a fire of burning coals there with fish on it, and some bread. Jesus said to them, Bring some of the fish you have just caught. Simon Peter climbed aboard and dragged the net ashore. It was full of large fish, 153. But even with so many, the net was not torn. Jesus said to them, Come and have breakfast. None of the disciples dared ask him, Who are you? They knew it was the Lord. Jesus came, took the bread, and gave it to them, and did the same with the fish. This was now the third time Jesus appeared to his disciples, after he was raised from the dead. When they had finished eating, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you truly love me more than these? Yes, Lord, he said, you know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my lambs. Again, Jesus said, Simon, son of John, do you truly love me? He answered, Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said, Take care of my sheep. The third time he said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was hurt because Jesus had had asked him the third time, Do you love me? He said, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. Jesus said, Feed my sheep. I tell you the truth, when you were younger, you dressed yourself and went where you wanted. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hands, and someone else will dress you and lead you where you do not want to go. Jesus said this to indicate the kind of death by which Peter would glorify God. Then he said to him, Follow me. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Please join me in prayer. God, our great creator, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be found pleasing in your sight. For you are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. So we're here in the Black Hills, and it is one of the oldest mountain ranges in the world. Uh, The granite core, which reaches its peak at the iconic Black Elk Peak, is dated to be roughly 1.8 billion years old and other regions of the Black Hills have been carbon dated around 2.2 or 2.8 billion years old. And they're believed to be the oldest mountain range in North America, and Black Elk Peak, being 7,244 feet, is the highest mountain peak east of the Rockies until you get to the Swiss Alps. And in all of that time, at least as much as is recorded, The Black Hills have been home to the Kiowa, the Arapaho, Cheyenne, Crow, and Lakota most recently, as well as plenty of other tribes and now us. This mountain range pops out from nowhere in the Great Plains and offers a reliable place to find resources like ponderosa pines and game like mule deer and white-tailed deer when they're not so reliable on the plains or requires much more travel to find that. It also provides a number of resources for shelter where water can be found during the winters or during the summers when that's not really possible out on the plains and uh, often provides physical shelter from the harsh winds during the winter. So physical places and geographic locations hold sacred meaning And that has been documented the world over. An indigenous scholar um, and somebody who was born in Custer named Linnea Stunstrom, who is a leading archaeologist, wrote that people everywhere attach meaning to place. Distinctive features such as mountains, rivers, lakes, unusual rock formations can evoke powerful memories 
of tribal history, our origin stories, and our personal experiences. We all have some kind of connection to this mountain range and this region. Whether we're a fourth generation rancher, we were raised here and moved away only to find our ways back, or we've always loved this place to visit and finally found a reason or a chance to get out here. But something ties us to this place one way or another. And I think I've mentioned before that when I was growing up, my family just adored camping. And we can't, went out as much as we could. And one of our favorite places to go to was Sylvan Lake. To the point that when my dad died, we joked about putting at least some of his ashes in the fire pit at our favorite campsite. Places have a way of getting under our skin to a point where we seek any way we can to find our, our way back to them. Something that I do a lot while I'm working on homework or cranking out papers is turn on nature documentaries and wildlife series like Planet Earth or Our Planet, really anything narrated by da David Attenborough. And while I may not have the means to get to those places that I want to go, it's a decent way to at least see them. But when we get to the Genesis stories, there's not one creation story, but two. And those are in chapter one and chapter two, and the verses that we heard this evening are from chapter one. And it's a story that calls creation good and details that humans are made in God's image. And when we turn to the story in chapter two, it says that before any wild plants appeared on the earth and before the crops grew, because the Lord God hadn't yet sent rain on the earth, and there was still no human being to farm the fertile land, though a stream rose from the earth and watered all of that fertile land, the Lord God formed the human from the topsoil of that fertile land and blew life's breath into his nostrils, and the human came to life. And we are filled with that breath of new life. We are filled with the divine, and we are called very good. What can often be overlooked in both versions of the creation story is that the first instruction that God gave Adam was not, in fact, to never eat the forbidden fruit from the tree of knowledge of good and evil, but was instead to name the animals and to be stewards of that very good and new creation. We see places throughout scripture where that idea is repeated or brought up again, even if it's not an explicit repetition of the command to be stewards of the land. The themes and the relationship between faith and place crop up throughout the Bible and stories throughout of our ancestors and faith leaders over time. Stories like Ezekiel's visions of the new temple, the imagery of new life found throughout the Psalms, prophets finding solace in the wilderness, Jesus seeking space in the mountains to pray, there are all still places like that for many of us, but our modern society has placed so much emphasis and value on those places that are man-made. I wrote my undergraduate thesis in 2018 and 2019 on the sacredness of place and how people identify with sacred places, where I focused on the relationship here between the Lakota and the Black Hills. And during that process of doing the final edits, a cathedral in France that you might be familiar with burned, Notre Dame. And within hours, millions and millions of dollars had been donated towards restoring and renovating the cathedral. And less than a year later, over 46 million acres, or 72,000 square miles in Australia, experienced some of the worst fires they've seen since the 1974 and 1975 season. But it was still a fight to get international attention around the reality that close to half of the continent was on fire. Humans have adopted a preference for those man-made structures that show off how much we can accomplish when we have the resources, like enough money, to make those lofty dreams of unreal architecture tangible and known, often to the detriment of our relationship with the natural world. In our gospel story from John, like Scott said, we encounter the disciples after Jesus had been resurrected, but before they had seen him in that resurrected form with wounds and all. So the disciples are mourning. They know that Jesus has risen, but they don't know anything else about what's going on. 
and they're grieving and they're lost and they're uncertain of where to go, what to do, who to be. And in that, Peter announces he's going fishing. In the most human way, he says, I'm going to go fishing. I know this. This is something that's familiar and easy. I will do it. And that feels right. And when things get uncertain and messy, we turn to what's comfortable and familiar, what makes sense and feels real when it's the only thing that we have to grasp onto for a sense of stability or reality. And when we encounter Jesus and Peter, we're reminded of Peter's betrayal of Christ before the crucifixion. And we're again reminded of the ways that human temptations and tendencies are not something that Jesus embodies or embraces, where it would be so easy and so tempting to turn away from somebody who's hurt him. Jesus keeps calling and keeps claiming Peter. No matter what he's done or the ways he's fallen short or the ways he's been merely human, Jesus never quits or gives up on that goodness that he calls Peter to. The same way that Jesus never gives up on Peter and never quits on him, never stops calling him to more and to better, he never stops calling us. He never quits on us. We're called to continue serving and continue honoring God and continue responding to that. And that means not only responding to the calls that are placed on each of us as individuals, but to respond to the call on us collectively to serve and steward the natural world. If we turn back to look at the creation stories, humans are not the only part of creation that are called good. The water of the earth is called good. The light and the darkness are called good. The birds of the sky and the animals of the land are called good. The trees, the flowers, the bugs, the frogs are all good, even the ones we might be afraid of or strongly dislike, like snakes and spiders. We are constantly invited to respond faithfully to this call of stewarding and caring for the natural world, for the good earth that provides home for us, for the natural places that reflect the divine. We have places that provide for us in reciprocal relationship. The places that we love and the places that fill us and offer a certain closeness to the divine are the places we are responsible for for exactly that reason. The Lakota have a different understanding of constellations that we do. Instead of adopting the Western constellations of Greece and Rome, like Ori Orion and Pegasus, Cancer, Gemini, Capricorn, all of those, the stars served instead as a tool for navigation and connection to the past. The seasonal movement of the nomadic people is reflected in and corresponds with the constellations and movements of the stars. But more than reflecting the movement of the people, the constellations reflect a physical geography of the Black Hills, particularly sacred sites like Bear Butte, Devil's Tower, and Yonkara. And for the Lakota, those constellations are visible scriptures read at night and mirrored on the land during the day. And I'm not trying to say that we should adopt the Lakota belief systems or take on those systems what I am saying is that we can still learn from and with them what it means to live in a reciprocal relationship in the sacred and the good places that we encounter and where we live. When we hold closely this call to care for the very good creation, we reflect the sacredness of that place in the ways we operate within them. These places that are sacred for so many people are essential sources for our spiritual renewal and connections with God. And once they're gone, there's something that can't be brought back. We live in a time where humans have over-exaggerated our impact on the natural world with large corporations and their exports of carbon dioxide, the commercial fishing industries over-harvesting our oceans, and our traditions of making more than we need and taking more than we need and wasting so much of it. Those have placed us in a time where we've harmed the natural world and the places and animals that are sacred to us and essential for our survival and spiritual well-being. We are called very good, and we live among a world that is called good, a world that we are called to be stewards for. 
And this is an essential aspect to preserving places for our spirits to be renewed and to respond faithfully to the call placed on all of our lives. There are places and opportunities to embrace more collaborative relationships with the natural world and our siblings in creation for our own sake and for the world. Amen.
May you go now as a people who have been named by God and claimed by God, so you can live the love of God. Amen.